Iraq, Marines are targeted by a deadly sniper. When one is hit, another throws the rule book aside. Sometimes you have to do what you gotta do to save your brother. Now this Marine is in the same lethal crosshairs. Oh, hit me with a sledgehammer. Nearly losing his own life, his rescue effort fails. I got banged up. He said I lost one of my guys. The sniper's shots damage more than flesh and bone. Gunfights prior to that, I was unstoppable. I was Superman. Get back in the fight. A Marine's battle to heal turns out to be this warrior's biggest fight to survive. In the wild, when things go bad, they go bad fast. Without warning, your life can hang by a thread. Adventurer and survivor Craig DiMartino fought back from his own wilderness disaster to reclaim his life. Now Craig meets other courageous outdoorsmen who beat the odds and return from their own fight to survive. Hi, I'm Craig DiMartino. Outdoorsmen can find themselves in survival situations they never expected, as I did in my own climbing accident. But when a man chooses to go to war, he knows full well he may end up in a fight for his life. Marine Corps Master Sergeant Buck Doyle considered himself indestructible, and the Brotherhood of the Corps meant everything to him. But on his deployment to Anbar Province in February of 2007, Buck would discover that he was neither bulletproof nor emotionally invincible. Early morning, May 26th, 2007. A convoy of four Humvees moved along a road north of the Iraqi city of Fallujah. In the vehicles were a dozen US Marines. These were members of an elite unit known as Recon Marines, an outfit akin to the Navy SEALs or the Army's Green Berets. They were heading to a remote forward operating base an hour or so away. Troops at that small outpost had been under attack by an elusive and deadly enemy sniper. And these recon marines had been tasked to assist in eliminating the sniper. Typically, recon marines conducted operations under cover of darkness. This unusual daylight mission meant the team needed to be extra vigilant. But their platoon sergeant, Gunnery Sergeant Buck Doyle, wasn't worried. He knew his Marines could handle the situation. Come on, come on, come on. Move it, double time it. Come on, don't have a picnic up there, let's go. Probably trained with it, my platoon it. more than most people like me to. Up. When you attain the position of platoon sergeant, right side. you're responsible for training those underneath you. Good, much quicker than last week. Let's go, move it. I wanted to be the best. So every time a team went out, I, I conducted the operation with them. Kilo talk, this is Pale Horse 2 over. We have eyes on a military. That relationship is one that is very, very challenging. Never ending, never forgiving, 24-7, 365. And you do start to develop a bond out there. These guys, we're family, we're all brothers. As far as he was concerned, the Marines that, you know, his Marines, they were family too. If there's anything you need to talk to me about? I mean, anything. Don't hesitate to call me, okay? Understood. Okay. That bond that he had with his men was strong. It was, it was unbreakable. Gunny Doyle was riding in the last Humvee. At the head of the column, nearly 500 yards up the road, was the Humvee with Sergeant Nick Walsh. Walsh was Doyle's right-hand man. Although he didn't have as much experience as Doyle, Walsh did have proven communication and leadership skills, talents that Doyle had put to good use. All right, gentlemen, bring it in. We have a seven-day op coming up. We will be conducting multiple tasks. Everyone has their own personality, own strong suits. Listen, I need you to knock your jaw jacking off. Get your heads in the game. This briefing is going to take some time, so just settle in and get comfortable. With Nick, he was a communicator. He knew whenever I got frustrated about something or, you know, I got to get this done, he said, hey, okay, I got it. All right. I'll find you after we're finished. Roger that, Sergeant Walsh. After a while, I just looked at him and said, okay, you got it. He had a strength that I did not possess. All right, guys, seven day up, lots of time in the vehicles. Cruz, I need you to get the vehicles ready. Copy? So for him to be around me was always a plus. 
Nick was actually in the Marine Corps prior, got out, spent a few years as a civilian, and then came back into the recon community. And we were lucky enough for him to join our platoon. Not long into their drive to the outpost, the convoy encountered a tangle of civilian traffic. The Marines had driven into the Iraqi version of morning rush hour. Sir, 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 can you, I, I, I understand, can you, sir, can you please, please step back, Mike, water, water. Then, bad news. The lead vehicle, Sergeant Walsh's Humvee, collided with an Iraqi car. Just want to make sure everyone's okay here. Okay. Nobody was hurt, but the Humvee was not going anywhere. Please, 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 please. Kilo talk, Kilo talk. This is Pale Horse Actual. We have a down vehicle on the middle of Highway 1. The platoon commander radioed back to camp and requested a recovery vehicle drive out and fetch their disabled Humvee. Roger that. Standing by. Over. Meanwhile, we're sitting there in the middle of the road with a down vehicle. We're sitting ducks. To be in a stranded position, fully exposed in the daytime. Sergeant Walsh, give me a sit rep. Tie rod gunning, we ain't going anywhere. That is the worst case scenario. Let's see if we can fix this mess. Okay, I'm gonna post a vehicle both sides of Highway 1. Doyle quickly dispersed the remaining vehicles and set up a security perimeter as they awaited the arrival of the recovery trucks. Head on the swivel, everybody. Stay up on your car. Let's move. All right, guy. The temperature started getting hot. Let's go, let's go. Over 100 degrees. When you're sitting out there in the middle of nowhere, five minutes is forever. So four hours, this seemed like eternity. Kilo talk, this is Pale Horse 2. I need an ETA on that recovery team. Everyone's getting very impatient and antsy. Being out in the day, just sitting on the road was the worst thing could happen to a bunch of recon Marines. A team of recon marines remains stranded out in the open on an Iraqi road. I need an ETA on that recovery team. For hours in sweltering heat, they've been awaiting the arrival of a recovery vehicle to haul away their disabled Humvee. Sergeant Walsh, give me a sit rep. Tie rod gunning, we ain't going anywhere. The delay was excruciating for the marines. Head on the swivel, everybody. Sitting ducks in the wide open desert with little options for cover. Roger that, standing by, over. Platoon commander called back and asked, where are we at with the wrecking crew coming out to recover the vehicle? Can you give us a heads up before that recovery team arrives on scene? Over. So we said, hey, be sure to let us know when you leave Camp Fluja so we can rearrange our formation and prepare to receive you. But without any advance warning, the recovery team drove towards the Marines. They pulled into the formation and clustered their trucks around the disabled Humvee. I quickly drove in that direction to receive him. Doyle did not like what he saw. The clustered vehicles made for an enticing target. Our recovery team were all parked right next to each other, nice and tight. There was no tactical dispersion. Can you help me orchestrate this? We get this car out of here. So you basically had a big mess. I get out of my vehicle. This is why I asked for a heads up. The situation does not look good. And I started Kenny, forcibly need to get a telling people to get back in the vehicle. Gunny, I got Nick this. sees Gunny going off and okay, tries to assist. Move this car over here. Hey, guys, Gunny. The Jag, a Captain Marine Collins, lawyer, Jag stepped okay. forward to help deal with the civilians. The minute I engaged with him, that first pop went off. Doyle turned to see Sergeant Walsh drop to the ground. At that point, I just went into doing what I wasn't supposed to, and that's grab Nick. But that wasn't standard operating procedure, or SOP. The SOP is that when we've been shot, the, the best medicine is superior firepower, but at the same time, when you see one of your brother shot and bleeding, sometimes SOPs don't make sense. Sometimes you have to do what you gotta do to save your brother. I want to become a uh, reconnaissance. Craig DiMartino traveled yeah. to Utah to, to meet Buck police. Doyle and to learn firsthand why the platoon sergeant made the choice to help Walsh. What were you thinking in your head, or was it a thing? Was it even a thought? Why did you not do that? When you work up in a team or a platoon, over time, you develop that, that brotherly bond, that, that love. Right. If you see someone that you love injured or in harm's way or hurt, all that goes out the window. You're going to his aid no matter what. What I saw was one of my brothers hurt. 
and I was right there, and I was gonna do something about it. More sniper rounds impacted around Doyle and Walsh. I'm not surprised that Buck made the decision to do everything he could to save Nick, because you're simply not going to leave an individual out there alone. It wouldn't have mattered if it was Nick or me or a new private. If he was one of Buck's guys, Buck would have been out there dragging him back. The sniper's next shot found its target. This time, it was Doyle. Without warning, an enemy sniper opened fire on Sergeant Nick Walsh and Gunnery Sergeant Buck Doyle. As Walsh collapsed to the ground, Doyle stepped into the line of fire to pull his fellow warrior to safety. Then, a sniper round struck Doyle's chest body armor and ricocheted into his leg. Going into that situation, you felt like you were Superman. Right. But now all of a sudden, you get hit. Right. What were you feeling at that realization? Yeah, it's hard to describe it in words. It felt like eternity. I'm realizing how vulnerable I am. No one could have told me in a million years that that was a card hand I was gonna play one day. And boom, it's there. The sniper had zeroed in on Doyle and fired again. So at that point, I'm on the ground, trying to regain my bearing. Uh, my arm oh. is twisted up like a Muppet. Get Nick, Nick. They got it. Doyle was severely wounded, but he still focused on saving Walsh. It's okay. Oh, somebody get Nick. They got him. They got him. Go, 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 go. The Marines loaded Doyle and Walsh into Humvees and rushed them to the hospital back at camp. And it wasn't until after my first surgery, I came to inside a recovering room, and I had my platoon around me. I remember the first thing I asked is, where's Nick? And they all looked at me. And no one said anything. That's what I do. Sergeant Nick Walsh died on the battlefield shortly after being hit. There on that hospital bed, Doyle realized that it really wasn't the shattered arm or fractured leg that hurt him. His real pain came from an unseen injury. Up until that point, I went through my Marine Corps career and all the schools and the gunfights prior to that and all the missions. Um, I was unstoppable. And then all of a sudden I get hit with a bullet and, and watch one of my brothers die. And um, I, I, I was starting to realize and understand what kryptonite feels like um, when you're Superman. And uh, it was a horrible feeling. Doyle's thoughts then turned to his wife. When you're sitting there, it seems like forever. I remember specifically just wondering, you know, did I say I love, did I tell my wife that I loved her the last time we talked? Thanks. I'll be right outside if you need anything. Later on that day, they brought me a phone in, and I called the wife. Hello? Alan. Back? Yeah, it's me. As soon as I heard his voice, I knew it wasn't the same as the other calls. He said, I need you to listen to me. Got banged up. She goes, what do you what mean, do you banged up? up? I said, well, I got shot. You know, how bad are, are you going to be okay? And I just wanted to know that he was going to, to live. The thing is, I... But then there was a really distinct shift I mean, in his voice. I lost one of my guys. 
I heard the crack in his voice and, and it really changed. And, At that point, I was more worried about his heart and his head than I was his physical well-being. Buck? I'm still here. Because I knew that for him, losing one of his guys, that was the worst thing that could happen and probably one of the toughest places that he could be in. For the seasoned leader, coming to terms with losing one of his Marines, a valuable warrior and a dear friend, became the most torturous wound to heal. Kenny, I got this. On May 26, 2007, a sniper killed Marine Sergeant Nick Walsh and then put his crosshairs on Gunnery Sergeant Buck Doyle. Rounds hit Doyle in his leg and his arm, but Doyle didn't die. But if Doyle was ever to lead Marines into combat again, he would have to heal not only those physical injuries, but an emotional trauma as well. How hard was that to, to reconcile in your head? I had eight days to walk around. My arms cut open. I got tubes going in. I got a wound vac hooked to me. I'm going to the bathroom, and, and you look in the mirror, and it just hits me. I just, for the first time, I'm looking at myself in the mirror with all this. And it all started hitting me, you know. Am I going to return to the battlefield? Am I still that guy? Am I that guy that can go in harm's way and still perform at that, that level with no hesitation? That is a scary question to ask yourself because I couldn't see any resemblance of that guy in the mirror. Right. I knew in, internally, Bill, see that guy, it, it, it's in here. And that's when Kyle tells me, hey. You need to get back in the fight. You, you need gotta to heal, heal up, up and you gotta back. get back in the fight. And at that moment, she just confirmed that yes, I need to get back out there. And you know, when you turned to me and, and he, he, he said, Kyla, I need to tell you that I'm sorry. And I said, why, why are you sorry? Are you? And he said, you know. Because in that moment, when everything happened. I, I knew. knew I was standing there in the line of fire and that I was going to get shot and that I was, I, I probably, probably would get killed. killed I didn't hesitate. I didn't uh, just. He felt guilty that that was a choice he was making and he knew he had a wife and kids at home. I said, if you hadn't made that choice, then you wouldn't have been the man that I married. The guy that turned around to help Nick and the guy who was willing to sacrifice his life for his fellow Marine, that's the guy that I married. If you hadn't made it back because of that, I, I could live with that and I could tell your children about that. You have to keep living your life doing what you know is right. For two years, Doyle worked hard towards full recovery, and in 2009, he was given a chance to join another Marine unit heading to Afghanistan. He took it, and alongside fellow Marines, he proved to himself that he could still do his job in combat. I have my mojo back, but remember what kryptonite feel like? It was always there. So every step forward right. I took, I took knowing the consequences. I lived it whether it's me getting hurt or someone else getting hurt. Right. I knew what that was like. Where before, train hard, get out there and get some. Buck was the epitome of what a warrior is, what a gunfighter is. That guy that was never going to quit and never going to oh. stop until the fight was won. I don't think we're put here in life to learn from easy. I think we're here to learn from hard. So the obstacles are there to learn. Sometimes you just pray that you learn them fast so that the obstacles can be over. <laughs> Buck Doyle retired from the Marine Corps in 2010 as a Master Sergeant after 21 and a half years of service. Today, he owns a company called Follow Through Consulting that provides, among many things, expert firearms training for qualified civilians, law enforcement, and US military. If you look off to your right, 
have a few targets out there in the cliffs. Craig DiMartino visited the range for a bit of what Buck does best. And it was no surprise to find Buck's two daughters hitting 12-inch steel targets at 500 meters. You've kind of taken it upon you to teach them guns right. from a very young age. Right. Why is that important to you to, to give them that? There's a discipline in handling a firearm. There's safety. But then there's also an art to be able to perform with the firearm. That builds confidence. Absolutely. To me, it's just, it's just, it's an awesome feeling. Yeah, it's it's awesome to watch. Lean into it so you can kind of stable that position and manage recoil. Then, Craig tried his hand with a LaRue carbine. When you squeeze that trigger back, realign your sights. That starts our follow through. Nice, now you know your hold. Something I've noticed as you're kind of moving your hand is, tell me about the, your bracelet. The hero bracelet um, is my reminder of Nick. So it basically has his full name, his rank, the unit we served, first recon battalion together. And the day he passed away, so Nick was always off to my left. Every time we did a hit, we did recce patrols, we did convoys, he was right there. So I keep, I keep a reminder of him on my, my left side and uh, on everything I do. That's fantastic. 